In 1925, Americans focused their attention on the Scopes trial, a court case in Tennessee where a teacher was put on trial for teaching evolution. Yet three years before the infamous trial, the state of Kentucky nearly passed a law that would have forbidden the teaching of evolution. Join us today for a discussion with the KHS Research Fellow who is writing a dissertation about the evolution debates that roiled Kentucky in 1922. As we explore the pages of Kentucky history with Kentucky Chronicles. Kentucky Chronicles is inspired by the work of researchers from across the world who have conducted research at the Kentucky Historical Society or who have contributed to the Scholarly Journal, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, which has been published continuously since 1903. Hi, I'm Daniel J. Burge, the host of Kentucky Chronicles, a podcast of the Kentucky Historical Society. I'm the associate editor of the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, and I also coordinate our research fellows program, which brings in researchers from across the world to conduct research in the rich archival holdings of the Kentucky Historical Society. So we're delighted to have you today for this fellow talk. Emily Muick is a PhD candidate at Louisiana State University. She earned her BA at Michigan State University and is currently working on her dissertation, which is entitled, In the Beginning, Kentucky's Anti-Evolution Crusade. She is a recent fellow as she was here in May of 2022. So we are excited to check back in with her and see where her project has taken her over the last couple of months. So Emily, welcome. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Well, I have to admit, when I think about the anti-evolution debates of the 1920s, I immediately think about the Scopes trial and what happened in Tennessee. Can you tell us a little bit about the anti-evolution debate in Kentucky? Yeah, so that's a great question and lots of people really associate this whole movement across the 1920s with what happened in the summer of 1925 in Tennessee. But um, it was really a, a much larger movement. In total, about 20 states considered different evo anti-evolution bills. Only a handful of them passed, but it was really pretty uh, a pretty widespread movement on some level across the United States. And Kentucky was actually the very first. So in 1922, um, three different bills, they were all various forms of each other. They were, they were pretty similar, um, came before the Kentucky legislature. And they were the first of these bills anywhere in the United States. Um, and it, it really came out of um, the fact that education for the first time was really something that was touching everybody's lives. So across the United States in the end of the 19th and the early 20th century, public education was really taking off. Uh, child labor laws were meaning that uh, children were no longer working as much and therefore were going into schools. Compulsory education laws were coming up in Kentucky as across the, the country. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really sort of the first time that what's happening in schools is affecting everybody rather than just a, a small subset of the population. And of course, 1922, when Kentucky is considering this, we're not that far on from the First World War, which really rocked a lot of people's sense of the world and how people treated each other. And so a lot of people really were looking around to try to figure out what was happening in the world, what had caused this. Um, and a lot of people landed on evolution as an issue, much to the surprise of many scientists and you know science PhDs, science professors, who'd been teaching evolution in classrooms for a generation or two by this point. Um, so in Kentucky, it really comes out of the Baptist churches. In particular, there's a man um, named John William Porter. He was the, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Lexington and was also the editor for the Western Recorder, which is the, the Baptist magazine in Kentucky. And he had really landed on this evolution as sort of a, a, an issue in the culture that was causing all of these problems and did a lot across the uh, summer and winter of 1921 to get uh, Baptist churches, Baptist congregations behind the idea that perhaps this should not be something that was being taught to all their children in schools, that it would be bad for uh, the, the Commonwealth and the country more broadly. Um, so in 
pretty, pretty soon after the legislative session started in 1922, uh, a series of bills were proposed by uh, different people who had been working with John Porter that would have on some level banned evolution. They had they used different words, but most of them were some variation of banning evolution or anything that was eliminating God as the direct creator of man. And pretty quickly, this sort of other side formed to try to stop this, led by Frank McVeigh, who was then the president of the University of Kentucky. He was a relatively new university, or new to the University of Kentucky at this point. He'd only gotten there in 1917. Um, and they sort of had this standoff between the two of them where they were both trying to, to make this argument to the people of Kentucky and to the country more broadly about whether or not on the one hand, evolution was bad and contradictory to uh, the sort of fundamentalist understanding of the Bible and morality, or on the other hand, if the, if this would hurt education in the state just when the state was really trying to ramp up um, public education movements. And there's sort of this really interesting third person who is a pretty prominent player in these debates, and his name was Edgar Young Mullins. He was the president of what was then called Louisville Theological Seminary, but is now the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is still in Louisville. Um, and Mullins was sort of existing between the two of them. He was, of course, a Baptist. He was a very prominent Baptist in Kentucky and around the country. And he fervently disagreed with evolution as a concept, both practically and morally, but also didn't think that it should be legislated in any way. So he was sort of working in the shadows going between Frank McVeigh, who he liked personally and wanted his side to win, and also John Porter, who he worked with a lot professionally. They sort of tended not to get along, but they they were very much on the same side in that they were trying to pro promote uh, fund, uh, you know, the Baptist faith. And so there's sort of this weird, at the, the leadership level, this sort of weird triumvirate of people that exist across the full spectrum of evolutionist, anti-evolutionist, but not wanting to participate too much in it legally, and an anti-evolutionist. Um, and it sort of hits Kentucky society and a lot of people jump in and participate. The, the Lexington libraries suddenly have no books left on the shelf about evolution when nobody had checked them out for, for years. Um, so a lot of people in Kentucky were trying to bring themselves up to speed on this. And um, it became a pretty popular point of discussion across the state for these few months that it was being considered by the legislature. Um, so much so that sort of the final set of voting for these bills is what I think of as is a real high moment in, uh, you know, parliamentary drama. Um, they ended up having on the final bill, which was in the House, they had to take three different votes because the, the first one, so many people were trying to get out of voting because it was such a contentious issue that on the, the, the first balloting, the, there was a simple majority in favor of banning evolution, but they didn't have a large enough number of people there to, to pass it. Nobody wanted to put their, not enough people wanted to put their name on one side or the other. Uh, the second round, they, they convinced the parliamentarian to give them a second round, and then it went in the other direction and it would have killed the laws. And the side said, well, that's not fair. They just got a second try. So then they said, you know, we'll do a third round and staffers have to go out into Frankfurt get everybody that they can cajole into coming back to work and it ends in a tie and they don't know what to do. And so one man who'd been abstaining for the same reason that everybody else had wanted to abstain, that he didn't want to put his name on either side, uh, finally stands up and says, you know, we'll kill this. Like it doesn't, it doesn't need to go forward. Um, so it's really sort of by the skin of its teeth that Kentucky is not the, the first state in the union to ban evolution but because it's the first to consider it and there had been so much national attention sort of watching what was going to happen um that ends up becoming the blueprint for how other states don't write those laws so william jennings bryan who i'm you know 
is sort of one of the, the faces of this national movement, but wasn't all that involved in the Kentucky debates. Um, basically came back, looked through these laws and said that there was too, too much of a punishment attached to it. So if a teacher under these bills, if it had passed, if a teacher had been teaching evolution, they would have lost their job, potentially been jailed and been fined. And he said that was that was too much. It gave it gave the excuse to ban to to not ban evolution. And so, a couple of years later, when in Tennessee there are lawmakers writing those the bill that will become the Butler Act, that will you know become the thing at issue in the Scopes Monkey trial, they leave the punishment out entirely expressly because that is what had had happened in Kentucky. Um, so that's sort of the the quick version of what happened, it's really a wonderful moment of Americans trying to figure out what this new thing, these schools, what it's gonna look like and what it's gonna look like to have to agree communally on how we're raising children. Cause it's the first time, you know, we have to do that. Cause it's the first time we're educating children as a whole society rather than sort of more split up into to private schools or jobs or home homeschooling. Which is so tough because you have so many different moving parts. I think that's the thing that's that's really impressive, um, is juggling those different parts. Sort of okay, here's what happened in the state itself. Here's religion. Okay, here's World War One. There's just so many different issues that are popping up at the time that you're really dealing with. Which is one of the things that I find fascinating about this because I entered this. I knew nothing about sort of of this debate apart from the Scopes trial. So having you know seen your presentation, re read some of your stuff. It's just fascinating. But I did want to sort of bring this around. You got your BA from Michigan State. You're now at Louisiana State University. So what sort of drew you to this topic? Why Kentucky? Is it just because of what you were just talking about? Because it's just there that this debate really kicks off? Or is there, what sort of sets Kentucky apart in this, in this debate that just breaks out like across so many different states in the 1920s? So I'm from Michigan. I now live in Louisiana. I the first time I ever set foot in Kentucky was this past summer when I was at KHS. Um, the reason I landed on Kentucky is that I was really interested in this sort of, you know, hyper politicization of education and of science because it's, it's so pervasive in our world. And I sort of was looking into why, where, where it started. And it really starts with the evolution debates and more particularly when you just look at the Scopes Monkey Trial, which is, you know, absolutely worth looking at, it is really one of the, the high points of the 1920s and has very, very, very long tales through American, you know, popular and intellectual culture. But because it was so nationalized, each side could basically look across the nation and say, who are the biggest anti-evolutionists that we can find that can make a good argument? Who are the biggest evolutionists that we can find who can make a good legal argument? And so the Scopes Monkey Trial is not representative of what's happening for most people, how most people are experiencing this, even if they were listening to it on the radio, it's not necessarily representing sort of the two most common opinions. It's representing the people at the polls. And so I had wanted to look at what this looked like in places that had national attention. Kentucky had national attention. A lot of people were following it, but maybe that wasn't having people from other states jump in and lead the discussion. I wanted to look at somewhere where the communities themselves were producing these leaders and what that looked like. And of course, what I found was that, you know, there are some people that are really ardent anti-evolutionists and there are some people who are pretty ardent in the opposite direction. They, but there's this sort of middle ground, um, sort of in this leadership that was who I found Edgar Young Mullins to be. But as I looked through, um, newspapers and other things that were showing what people without any platform were saying, this sort of middle ground of people that just said, you know, I've sort of got an opinion, but, you know, maybe, maybe the children should learn this even if it's wrong, or, you know, maybe, maybe because it's wrong, the children should learn this because then they will learn 
what something looks like when it's wrong. This sort of whole sort of glorious middle ground that got drowned out in the Scopes Monkey trial was suddenly the largest group of people that I could find. And that is, is not necessarily reflected in nationalized conversations of evolution, or I might say in other issues that we deal with, that the more nationalized it is, you know, we sort of lose some of these voices in between. And I think they are very important because that's how most people were interacting with, you know, this issue and others. And I think that does, you've, you've touched on this a bit, especially with some of these recent um, sort of points you've been making. We, we tend to lump people into one or two sort of extreme categories. They're sort of William Jennings Bryan, and we've seen this sort of depicted in popular film. Um, I think of Inherit the Wind. You have these different examples of sort of, okay, this is one side, this is the other. What you're pointing out, and I think the point you're trying to make is that, okay, there's a group of people in the middle who don't necessarily sort of, they're not as polarized as we tend to think of that. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Are, are they the types that are, are sort of leading this discussion? I think my question has always been, do we just focus on William Jennings Bryan because he makes the most noise? I mean, <laughs> is there sort of a point where we sort of do like, oh, th like the speech is all of this and we lose that there is middle ground sort of in all of this? Yeah, well, I mean, William Jennings Bryan is flashy. I'll give him that. Yeah. He is splashy. <laughs> yes. And at the time he had a lot of name recognition too, right? Because he'd been the Secretary of State. He'd been nominated. Uh, to be the president a few times. So, mm -hmm. you know, he, he did have a large voice, but he didn't spend a lot of time during the actual Kentucky debates in Kentucky or dealing with Kentucky. It was really led by people that lived in Kentucky or were from Kentucky themselves. Um, so <laughs> the these people that exist sort of in the middle that are participating in the debates, you know, through newspapers, through checking out library books, they are, you know, they're representing this middle ground, but they're doing it in sort of a diverse way. They're not all saying, I don't know, you know, I don't know what opinion it is, and therefore I'm going to back out. Some people are saying, you know, I have I have, an, I have an opinion on this, but I don't think it should be legislated. Some people say, I think we should be able to legislate it, but maybe this isn't you know, we should be able to legislate schools, but maybe this isn't the thing we do. Um, one of my absolute favorite uh, people whose opinions I found was a, a man who lived in Berea, and he published a handful of op-eds talking about this in his community paper, and then finally just said, you all know where I live. If you, if you want to fight with me anymore, just come by my house. You know, so like these are people who are complex people who see different things. And even though they're sort of taking this middle ground, they aren't necessarily doing it in the same way. Um, what I found is that across the board, community newspapers, state newspapers had, you know, their op-eds were being flooded with people that had something to say on this issue. But a fair number of them were sort of hedging hedging around different points some some were enthusiastic one way or the other most were not a handful were confused many were very funny um around the country people were hopping in to say you know i think what's happening in kentucky or maybe we should be paying more attention to kentucky you know lots of different opinions um that really reflect that even, you know, the whole point of this sort of middle ground is that they are not, they are not all seeing eye to eye, but they're all wanting to deal with education for the first time. So they're trying to figure out where they sit, but the two seats, you know, the two seats, so to say, that we think of are not necessarily what they're looking for. They're looking for something else. Um, and I think you know, individuals like Edgar Mullins really, you know, sort of almost give a voice to this, but even he himself was sort of staying in the shadows because he didn't, he knew that it wasn't really a good look to get into a fight with the Baptist church when he's the president of the Baptist church's seminary, but also he's friends with and works quite a lot as a fellow, you know, school administrator with Frank McVeigh. So, you know, these are complex issues that people are taking complex positions on.
which I think is a really good way of looking at it. Because I do think we tend to sort of reduce people to, oh, they just had this opinion or that one. But I think as you're pointing out, you could be a, a strong Baptist and still be relatively open to, okay, this is something that, you know, maybe it's, we don't need to legislate or it's something that's, you know, we can discuss in a level-headed way. And I like that sort of, that sort of debate. I do want to swing around just a little bit and ask you about sort of your own work in the dissertation, because for some of our listeners out there, Emily is working on the dissertation. It is a process. Uh, we were talking about this before we went live. I mean, writing a dissertation is its own thing. It's just, it takes a lot of work. You said you had never really been the Kentucky or you hadn't conducted research here before you got here in May to do some research. Can you just explain a little bit about the research process? Sort of what it's like, what you're hoping to find, but also for listeners, what you found at KHS that sort of helped you as you continue this process of sort of figuring out how to write the dissertation, which is a process in itself. Yeah, so on, on the point of sort of con coming to Kentucky and KHS, first of all, Kentucky is beautiful and goodness gracious, all states should aspire to have as many horse statues as Kentucky <laughs> it's Lexington, does. Lexington, yes. It's yeah, Lexington in particular, I just, I mean, inspirational, everyone should, should do it with, you know, whatever their thing is, it was amazing. Um, but a lot of the process is really, you know, I wanted to figure out wh where a lot of the issues we're having today with public schools were coming from. And so this is sort of the, you know, the evolution debates are sort of the beginning of that. And Kentucky is the beginning of that debate. Um, and so I sort of had a question going into writing a dissertation. And then from there, it's just a lot of trying to read, trying to figure out, you know, what different people were saying, where, where they were coming from, why they had taken this as an issue. Because of course, evolution, they chose to make evolution an issue. It didn't have to be an issue. It hadn't been in the years before this. Um, so it's a lot, of, a lot of reading, a lot of reading what other historians have had to say on this trying to find as many uh, people this I use newspapers a lot because that's a pretty good record of what average people were talking about. Um, and KHS is really wonderful for that because it's just a great repository of Kentucky history and both physically in person things that are not digitized and it's wonderful wonderful digitized collection. There's just a very rich archive of Kentucky things. And that includes, you know, photographs of school children that are, you know, distracted and running around and doing things that kids do. And, you know, legislative pieces of, you know, pieces of legislation, things that are, you know, very formal or very written, you know, written down and sort of everything in between. So KHS was really wonderful for that. Um, and, you know, does a wonderful job of trying to make the things that it has accessible, not just to historians in Kentucky and around the country, but also to, to people who are maybe interested in getting into history or in, in their family, genealogy, that um, sort of makes history more accessible, or hopefully makes pe history more accessible to, to people that maybe don't have the the fortune of being able to dedicate a, you know, a substantial chunk of their time to a formal education in history. I think you had on something that's so challenging for those who haven't done a dissertation, balancing the original research and figuring out how to do that, develop your own argument, but then you do so much reading. You've got to sort of compete with the other interpretations that are out there and figure out, you know, how does this fit in? How am I going to do this? And I think what you're doing here is really important because you are saying, okay, here's why this particular debate really does matter. And I think that's something both for people who are interested in Kentucky history, but also just those who are interested in the 1920s or these debates, or as you, as you explained earlier, the larger debates that still are ongoing about what's taught in schools and how we do this. I think your work speaks to a lot of that. So I do want to sort of wrap this up, but bring us to our last question. Um, writing a dissertation can be a lonely process, and, and we try to give um, individuals outlets here to talk a little bit about their work and give you a chance to sort of 
um, hit on some of that. With the audience here today, what what would you be interested that they take away from this in terms of your research? Like what's the big takeaway or the thing that they could should think about sort of walking away from your project? I think it's really common, at least amongst the people that I know and my you know family and friends to, you know, every every day if you open the newspaper, there's some culture war, something happening. And it's usually something about the schools. I mean, I was this morning, the the New York Times had op-eds on what's happening in public schools. Mm -hmm. So this is really something that is very real to people, both just in the news and it's where many people are educated themselves. It's where they send send their kids. And I think it's important to know that this is not just coming out of nowhere. This is not the first time the nation has tried to, to reconsider what's happening in schools. It's not the, you know, this is a continuation of a debate that we've really been having for a century. And they did not solve it in 1920. You know, there's sort of a stalemate reached on what people were gonna do. So Kentucky obviously kept teaching evolution, but other states made different decisions. But it, never went away and it hasn't gone away. We have not resolved the issue yet. And it's been, you know, four generations, we're still there. Um, and so I think a lot of this, you know, that could sort of seem discouraging, but in a very different way, a lot of it is actually very encouraging because there's, you know, there's not a simple solution to this issue that we're having. And the wonderful thing is because it's not the first time we're dealing with this issue, we have, you know, a hundred years of debates that people were trying to bring up different points, bring up uh, different concerns, and we have a wonderful record of what they were worried about, what they wanted to do, how they started trying to resolve some of these issues, to be a guide to us today as we sort of, as a culture, move through this again or continue to move through this. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. I, I sort of see it as hopeful in a sense, because I mean, you see the different sides debate, they come through, but at the end of the day, you sort of see where people end up. And it's a very interesting sort of way of looking at things like, okay, here's people debated these issues, but they did sort of come to a conclusion of like, okay, maybe this isn't something that we need to pass right now at this point in time. And then we sort of ignore that. So I think it's really important that you're sort of bring us back to, oh, maybe we should remember this because this is an important moment both for Kentucky, but I, as I like to point out, it's, it's also important for U.S. Um, I think these broader debates, which is something that's really, really significant. Yeah. I think that's another thing that I, I sort of like to, to think about, too, is just I, it's very easy to like look at the world and see it as very polarized. Mm -hmm. But this is another moment where we remember it as very polarized. But that, you know, that memory is a little bit false. There are people in between. And so, you know, maybe maybe that speaks to the fact that we are hopefully not as divided as it's easy to think we are um that that might be moving into the to a little bit of naivety but i i would like to think that this was a time that america seemed to be very divided but falsely seemed to be divided there were there were problems but there were there was a lot binding people together there was a this sort of middle ground of people that didn't just want to fight with each other. And hopefully that means that perhaps in America today, we have, have a middle ground that'll, that'll do some of the work of bringing us together. No, that's a really good way of putting it. So I'm gonna leave it there. That is Emily Buick, a PhD candidate in history at Louisiana State University. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad we could host you at the Kentucky Historical Society, but of course, we wish you the best of luck with the dissertation itself, um, that it goes well that the research keeps going. It's a fascinating project. So I think we're all excited here to sort of see where this leads you. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Sometimes people have more in common than we think. Although we often focus on those who make the most noise or those who loudly voice their disagreements, Emily Muick reminds us that we should not ignore those who embrace common sense, solutions to controversial problems. For those who are interested in learning more about the ordinary Kentuckians who embraced a wide range of opinions on the issue of evolution in the 1920s, I encourage you to read Emily's article, In the Beginning, Kentucky and the Failure of the First Anti-Evolution Legislation, which was published in the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society and which is available on Project Muse. This brings another episode to a close. 
I would like to thank our guest, Emily Muick, for talking with me today. Kentucky Chronicles is presented by the Kentucky Historical Society with support from the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. Kentucky Chronicles is presented by the Kentucky Historical Society with support from the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. Our show is recorded and edited by Gregory Hardison. Thanks to Dr. Stephanie Lang for her support and guidance. Our theme music is used courtesy of Pixabay. To learn more about our publication, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, or to learn more about our Research Fellows Program, please visit our website, history.ky.gov. If you have enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe. It really helps us to know how we are doing. You can also help us build a following by telling your friends to subscribe.